I'd say about 40 years. Somebody who has thrown mo- been thrown more than his share of curveballs in life, but he's risen above the obstacles. He's been down and never out. He's not only a world-class runner, but in my book, and I think most everyone's book, he's a world-class human being, a guy whose life really is a story of hope and redemption. Now, you know, you're the, uh, the real deal. Still the uh, seventh fastest American at the marathon distance. This is 36 years later after his epic uh, race. And before I uh, bring him on here, I just want to mention a couple of uh, a couple of his uh, honors and awards. I, I, I was impressed when I read through these. Uh, inducted into the National Distance Running Hall of Fame in 2010. 2009, the Running Event Hall of Fame and Lifetime Achievement Award winner. Two-time champion, Grandma's Marathon, 1981-1982. Held the course record at Grandma's Marathon for 33 years. It was finally uh, broke in 2014. Uh, Champion and course record holder. Still holds the record from 1987 at the Napa Valley Marathon. We're going to talk about that in a minute because I believe he is headed there tomorrow. See, I haven't turned his mic on and he can refute everything that I say as soon as I turn his mic on here. Uh, 1981 London Marathon champion. Second place finish and probably the most exciting marathon of all time. Boston 1982. We'll be talking about that tonight. Two-time Olympic trials marathon qualifier, only man to have ever run 13 consecutive personal bests in the marathon. There's something for you to shoot for, runners. Uh, Robert E. DeSeal Award for U.S. Outstanding Distance Runner in 1982. Roadrunners Club of America Hall of Fame, 1989. And here's the one that I really like. Runner's World Magazine, Comeback Runner of the Year. 1990 and you'll see why runner's world magazine 25th anniversary profile and courage award 1991 minnesota track and field hall of fame 2001 american record holder for 10 miles on the track 4905 1982 and last but not least 2006 and 2007 road runners club of america national masters marathon champion and uh i'm turning on your mic there dick and i was gonna try to uh, shorten that up, but I just couldn't. They, they all meant so much that I had to read them all. Well, Tim, and you know what? I don't have to correct you on anything because you were right on, on uh, just about well, all those things. In fact, I forgot about some of those um, awards and stuff. So uh, thanks for bringing back some good memory. Hey, I pumped you up a little bit here. Absolutely. Uh, you are, uh, I was really surprised that we could do this tonight because I think uh, you're on the road tomorrow. Is that correct? Yeah, I leave out of my uh, hometown of Bemidji, Minnesota, tomorrow at uh, 4 o'clock in the morning and fly to Minneapolis and then fly to Seattle and then Seattle to Sacramento and then I drive an hour to Napa for the 40th anniversary of the Napa Valley Marathon. Now, do you go to Napa? Do you go to that marathon every year? I've been, I, I, I ran it for the very first time way back in 1987, so 31 years ago, and then I they've had me back to speak uh, at it every year uh, for the last, um, oh, golly, 21 years. And you still hold that record, 216. Yeah, 216, 20. And um, you know what? The grandma's record at, at, uh, in Duluth, eventually it will be broken, and, and that's what records are for. And just like at grandma's, Tim, I always, and I always said this, and I really believed it, or meant it, is I wanted to be the, you know, one of the first people to congratulate the person that you know broke the grandma's record, and I was doing the play-by-play that day on the on the lead vehicle, and and I was I was I was the, when he came uh, the Kenyan that won the race in 2014 to break the record. When he came through the finish shoot, I was right there and gave him a big hug, and 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 hopefully um, the, the same thing will happen some year at the Napa Valley Marathon, and I can be the first one to congratulate him because. As I said, you know, that's what records are for. They're meant to be broken, and someday it will be broken at Napa. I see that Napa, somebody came close. Somebody did run a 216, and we're just seconds away. Yeah, but you know what? That was the record I broke. So that was set, I think, Oh, that's the... a guy named Jamie White, a California kid. And then I came out there. It was either a year or two after he set the record and, and broke it, but, but by only like 14 seconds or something like that. Uh, okay, now I understand what was going on there. I'll tell you what, uh, here's a question for you. When did you really realize that you had the gift? When did you realize that you could you could uh, run like this? 
Well, it sure wasn't when I was in high school because I, was, I started running as a junior to try to earn a letter jacket to uh, so I could get a. I, I I figured if I could earn myself a my high school letter jacket, I could you know I could get a date with a girl because I was very <laughs> shy and bashful. And so I went out for football and last less than an hour. And I remember getting gang tackled on the the first day of practice and getting up out of this pile of guys. And I'm thinking there's not a girl alive that's worth going through this. And, so I quit, and I went out for the cross-country team, and I wasn't very good. But um, by the time I graduated from high school, I'd fallen in love with running, even though I wasn't, you know, very good at it at the time. I you know, I never qualified for a state meet in Minnesota in cross-country or track, but the seed was planted. And I just, you know, I had really good coaches. Even my high school coach, who wasn't a runner, but, you know, we had such a small team, nobody got cut from the team, and he made it fun, and, and then I went to a small little uh, two-year um, agricultural college in southern Minnesota, and, and my coach there, Dr. John Folkrod, again, he was just a wonderful person. And I'll never forget, one day I was the last one out at practice, and I got done doing some intervals on the edge of a cornfield, and, and we were, him and me and Coach Folkrod were walking back to the, to the locker room, and he put his arm around me, and he says, You know, Dick? I really believe you can become as good of a runner as you want to be. And I never, ever forgot that. But I'll tell you, Kim, honestly, I never, ever thought in my wildest dreams running would take me to where it did. But, you know, when you fall in love with something and you have a passion for it and you, you pursue it and you want to do it to the best of your ability, and, and that's all I tried to do, and things just kind of fell into place. Uh, I tell you, uh, I, that's a fantastic statement. You can be as good as you want to be, boy. That could, that would work for anything. Absolutely. And listen, I've used that. What Coach Folkrod told me forty years ago. You know, I've used that in other areas of my life too. So you know, I've always said this when I get talks and whatever. You know, when you say something either positive or negatively to somebody, you never know how it's going to affect that person at that moment tomorrow. You know, next week, next month, or years down the road. So, you know, we, we, we need to be a little careful what we say, especially if we're saying something not so positive. But know that some of these things that you say to a person or a person says to you may stay with you for the rest of your life. And uh, if it's a good thing, you never know. It might enhance your life, that, as that did for me. That That is for sure. Well, uh, your first marathon, Now, I, I did read about uh, a few of uh, funny mistakes that you made in your first marathon. Uh, I want to know what your first marathon time was, because we're going to get to uh, your fastest time, the the epic duel. Uh, we'll get to that in just a moment. But uh, I go back, to, I, I'm a little bit older than you are, but uh, when, uh, when we were start, when we were running, there wasn't a whole lot of material out there about eating, drinking, uh, you know. The... <laughs> no. <laughs> Tell, tell me about some of the mistakes you made in your first, was it your first marathon or second marathon? Well, it, it was actually my second. So my first one, Tim, I ran, I was 21 years old. I ran the Pavo Nermi Marathon, which is almost, there's got to be coming up on their 50th anniversary soon. It's in a little town called Hurley, Wisconsin, right up on the, on the uh, northeastern part of Wisconsin, right on the, on the uh, border of the upper peninsula of Michigan. And, I ran that in 1977. I didn't, you know, I, I was hardly running, but, you know, you're 21 years old. And I thought, what the heck, you know, marathon kind of, sounds kind of neat. Well, I'll tell you, I finished. I ran 240, two hours and 47 minutes, but I swore I would never, ever run another marathon again. So if you want me to, I can try to quickly tell the second marathon is really where I made the mistake. So I was back at school at the um, – at uh, the small college, part of the University of Minnesota in southern Minnesota, and I, I would get up every morning and out of my dorm room, and I'd go downstairs and I'd, I'd buy the Minneapolis paper and I'd bring it up to my room and pull out the sports page and read it before class. So I get up this Tuesday morning and I go down and do that, and I I'm reading through the sports page and I, I notice this little box ad in the in, in the corner of the paper for this what was then called the City of Lakes Marathon. It's kind of what the Twin Cities Marathon is today. And for some reason, I saw that little box ad, and my brain said, you need to run that. Well, the 
problem was I hadn't been running much, and and it was Tuesday, and the race was coming up on Sunday. So <laughs> I thought, I'm not going to class the rest of the morning, and I pulled out a couple of boxes I had underneath my dorm bed that were filled with various running magazines, and I'm thinking, okay, there's got to be a – uh, an article in one of these magazines on how to how to train for a marathon in five days. And, you know, there's nothing close to a five-day program. Well, I'm getting towards the bottom of the box, and I come across this article about these guys and gals that they didn't just run marathons. They ran ultras, you know, 50 and 100 milers. And one of the guys said when when he ran them, he felt like he was, floating like a butterfly and i'm thinking yeah that's what i want to feel like like i'm floating <laughs> like a butterfly and he goes and he thought one of the things that helped him was that he fasted he didn't eat for a week i thought well golly i don't have a week but i got five days so i didn't eat anything for the rest of tuesday wednesday thursday or friday or saturday so sunday morning dawn i drive into the big city of minneapolis st paul and i park my truck and and I get out, and it's a perfect day, 40 degrees, late, you know, mid-October, no wind. And I thought, okay, Richard, now, you know that first marathon you ran, you didn't even warm up. You just kind of started running. And you know you've always run your best when you've done a good warm-up. So I took off running. Well, by the time I got done with my warm-up, I'd run about eight miles. And I'm thinking, well, boy, I feel pretty good now. So I get an, an, an eight An eight-mile warm-up before a marathon. Yeah, I, I <laughs> but I feel good and loose. So I get over to the starting area, and I'm and I start there, Tim. Yeah, I'm here. We're good. Okay, I, I feel a, I, I heard a beep on my phone. I thought it was um, anyhow. So I get over to the starting area, and I'm thinking, okay, Dick, you need to find some guys that are experienced at this marathon and know what they're doing, and, and just kind of run with those guys. So I'm and I look up towards the front. And I see a couple of guys I recognize because I'd seen their picture and read about them in the paper a few days before. One of the guys was a sub-220 marathoner, and the other guy was a sub-220 or sub-225 marathoner. And I'm thinking, well, they must know what they're doing. I'll just run with them. So I sneak up there. The gun goes off. We take off. We go through the first mile in five minutes and five seconds. I'm within 10 seconds of my personal best for the all-out mile, but I'm feeling like a million bucks. And I'm thinking, I'm thinking, well, you, just, you don't need to train for these things. You just don't eat for a, a five, six, seven days, whatever it is. So anyhow, we're going along, and the three miles, they, we come up to the first water station, and all those guys take water, and I, I didn't take a cup because I, I read somewhere, or I thought I'd read, where if you take water and you try to run a long ways, you're going to get a side ache. Well, of course, just the opposite, opposite is true, but I went the entire race without any water at all. And so I'm going along and, and um, feeling good six, seven miles. But about, about eight miles, my feet start getting real hot. Well, by nine miles, I look down, and these pretty blue shoes I was wearing had a real pretty purple tinge to them. I was... My feet were blistering and bleeding. I'm thinking, what the heck? I've never had a blister in my life. I thought, why now? And then I thought, could it be? Now, Tim, I'm not making this up. The day before, I went into a running store in downtown Minneapolis, and I, uh, I tried on a pair of these Nike waffle trainers. I put them on. I jogged up and down, took them off, put them in the box, and I told the guy, I said, I'll take them. He says, well, golly, don't you want to wear them around, buddy? Kind of get them you know, broke in a little bit. I said, nope, I'm running a marathon tomorrow morning, and I don't want to get them dirty. <laughs> I put my shoes on. Only my feet, they quit bleeding, they went numb, and I couldn't feel them anymore, so I was doing okay. Well, I, I, at about 14 miles, I fell off the lead pack, but I was still in, like, fourth, well within the top 10, because if you finish in the top 10, you got a trophy. Now, back then, they didn't even make running trophies. It was It looked like a bowling trophy. All they did was you know, break the bowling ball off, and it looked just like a runner. <laughs> I wanted one of these little trophies. Well, so I'm, I'm hanging in there, and at about 19 miles, I was just thinking about some of the things I ran about this thing that happens at 20 miles called the wall. 
But this article said, if you don't think about it, it ain't going to happen. So I kept it out of my mind. I'm coming up to the 20-mile mark. I look down, and here a guy must have snuck out of the house with his PJ still on and a can of blue spray paint and wrote, 20 miles, you're at the wall. And I'm thinking, <laughs> oh, man, my, my legs are going to you know, break like a toothpick. But they felt good. I get to 21, still feeling pretty good, still in fourth, 22. Tim, I get to the 23-mile mark. I go by the start-finish line. All I have to do is just one last loop around Lake Harriet, and I'm done. And I say to myself with a big smile on my face, Richard, you have got it made. Well, Tim, I took about three more strides, and all of a sudden my perfect little world starts coming to an abrupt end. I mean, I was, I, my, I was cramping in my calf, my quad, <laughs> my, my hammy. My, I, I was cramping so bad my ears were cramping up. My eyes open. So I was running with my eyes closed. I'd open them every once in a while just to make sure I wasn't going to run into a tree or something. And I'd see all these old guys flying by me, and I'm thinking, oh, there goes my trophy. Well, it was a four loop course, and these were people I was lapping, apparently. But anyhow, I finally finished, and I collapsed. And the volunteers come over, and they pick me up, and they put me on a park bench. And, and every once in a while, I'd I'd uh, open my eyes, and I'd see these TV cameras pointing down at me. And um, my buddies of mine later said, Beards, we were there watching you, and you were laying on that bench, and we didn't know if you were dead or alive. And every once in a while, you'd, you'd open your eyes and throw up your arms and say, Trophy, trophy, did I win the trophy? <laughs> and, anyhow, I, I ended up seventh place, got my little bowling trophy, and... Um, and ran 237, I think. And, and after that race, I swore I would never, ever run another one. But like a lot of things in life, Tim, you know, you get over some bad moments and you forget about them. And, and then I realized that if a guy is going to really run a marathon well, you got to train for it. And I learned a lot from that. Those, all those mistakes I made in that second marathon. I can't believe you didn't eat for like five days or take water. <laughs> yeah, either. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Oh, uh, I... I'll tell you what, uh, anything for that first piece of hardware, right? That first trophy. Oh, my God. You know, I, I'm sure one of my boxes, I don't have a trophy out in the house other than the, the clock that I got for, you know, the, at the Boston. Oh, uh, we're going to talk, we're going to talk about what you got for yeah. uh, second place and uh, what you get now. Can we, you want to jump to the Boston? Sure, whatever you want to do, Tim. So I'll tell you what. Uh, I, actually, here's a question. How many marathons have you run? You know, I, I get that question a lot, and I need to sit down someday and add them up. But it's it's got to be pretty close to 100. Okay, a lot more than I thought. Yeah, pretty close to 100. But, but you know, after, my, after I retired from that very high level of training and racing, and, you know, a lot of people thought, well, you know, you'll you'll – probably give up running or you'll for sure give up racing just because you'll you know you'll be so disappointed never being able to achieve those times again but that never happened to me and and um you know when i got into my you know mid 40s and into my early 50s i kind of got the competitiveness back into me again and and um and so i was you know racing at the time for me it was i was running you know in my early 50s i was running the low 240s which tickled me pink you know so uh and uh, and I still love to run today. Well, I tell you what, but you're. Boston, yeah. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, yeah, you're talking to a guy that was uh, pretty tickled with a 258. So I can't imagine running that kind of times. But uh, you really were peaking uh, peaking when uh, Boston came in 1982. Yeah, you know Boston has had always been a just you know when I got into running just such a you know I'd heard about the Boston Marathon and. And when I graduated from high school in, in, in May of 1975, the, you know, the, I was into running then at that point, obviously. And, and, you know, the month before I graduated, you know, Bill Rogers won his first Boston, and I, he was kind of my mentor. And, and I always, you know, followed his career and stuff. And, and uh, you know, he runs 209.55, and, and uh, it, was just a, it was just a neat time. But so when I graduated from high school, I, never would I have ever thought that seven years later I'd be standing 
in that little town of Hopkinton, Massachusetts, getting ready for the greatest foot race in the world. And, you know, that race, it'll be 36 uh, years ago coming up this April. And I, you know, I can't remember what I had for supper an hour ago, but I, I can remember that race that day like I ran it this morning. Now, for the listeners out there, you know, back then the Boston Marathon started at 12 noon, which, you know, isn't the, isn't the most, you know, normally the very good time of the day to run a marathon, but that was tradition. And so I get up to the start, and, and it's about 75 degrees at the start, and there's not a cloud in the sky, and I'm standing there on the start line, and the starter puts up his pistol, and he hollers, and I look to my right, and a couple guys down from me on that front line is Alberto Salazar, the world record holder, and I look to my left, and a couple of guys down from me is, you know, my, my buddy Bill Rogers, and four-time winner of the Boston Marathon, and I'm looking up and down this front row, and I'm seeing Olympians and world-class athletes from around the globe, and, and even though I'd been so focused for the last six months to get ready for Boston, and I knew I was in the best shape of my life, I was intimidated. And I thought, Dick, what the heck are you doing on the same start line with these guys? <laughs> but, you know, when that thought went, entered my right ear, before it got out my left side, I thought, no, Dick, you deserve to be here as, as much as anybody else. And with that, that gun went off, and Salazar shot out of there like he was shot from a rocket, and I was right along his side. And I remember we went through the first mile in four minutes and 33 seconds. Incredible. And I am hanging on, yeah, and I'm hanging on for dear life. And let me tell you, Tim, when you're hanging on and you still got 25.2 miles to go, it's not a very good feeling to have. And, and I just thought, well, you're just a little bit nervous, Dick, and you know, you'll be fine. And, and I get to mile two, and I, I felt worse than I did at mile one. But I, again, I just thought it was the nerves and whatnot. I hit mile three, and and I'm one of the most positive people you'll ever find. But when I hit that third mile, I felt so bad that one of the first thoughts that crossed my mind was to drop out. And you know, I I look back on that now, and and I I, I thought about that a lot, and I'm thinking, you know, how different my life would be if I had taken that easy choice and made up some cockamamie excuse that everybody would have believed, you know, I probably I wouldn't be talking to you probably. Who knows what I'd be doing or where I'd be. And, you know, like I've told myself and, and I tell others, you know, it's, it's those moments in our lives when, you know, we, we don't think we can take that next step towards that so-called finish line, yet we find a way and we do, and then we take another one after that and another. I thought, no, Dick, you can't drop out. You've worked too hard for this. And and uh, I hit mile four, and I, I didn't feel any better, but I didn't feel any worse. And at that point, that was a huge confidence builder for me. That decision, and, that decision really did change your life. And I want to back up just for a second. Tell the uh, listeners, sure. tell the listeners how the uh, Boston Globe described you. Well, the the day before the race, they were talking about different people that you know were going to possibly be up in the lead group and anyhow the boston globe called me dick beardsley the country bumpkin from minnesota <laughs> <laughs> they didn't and give I, you they you didn't know, give you a chance no they didn't give me a chance or really i'll be honest with you tim they didn't with salazar being there and uh they didn't give myself or much anybody else much of a chance that day against him and but you know that's why that's why they they run the race you know it's uh, it's just like any game, ball game you play, uh, football, hockey, basketball, whatever, baseball, whatever it is. That's why they play the game. You know, I mean, yeah, your record might not be as good as that person's or whatever or that team, but on paper, but that's why you play the game. And, and upsets are part of sport, and uh, it was close that day. <laughs> Go, going into that race, what was your uh, best time? My best time was uh, the previous June. Uh, of 81 when I went 209.36 at the Grandma's Marathon in Duluth. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All and, right. Uh, yeah. All right, back to this killer race. So, anyhow, I'm feeling good now, and back then, there weren't fencing up, there were no aid stations on the course, you just kind of got water from spectators, and I remember I'd, I'd grab a cup and I'd look at it, and if it was clear, I drank it, if it looked a little 
uh, a little uh, suspect. I just pour it on my head or throw it aside. And and as and there there was an estimated one and a half million spectators that day lying in the streets. And as each mile went by, that lead group got smaller and smaller until we got to the 17 mile point, And there were two guys left in the in the lead group, and it was me and Salazar. And they coached Bill Squires. They coached Bill Rogers at one time, and coached Salazar at one time. And he was my coach now at that point. And I remember him telling me going into the race, he says, Dickie, if you're in that lead group or close to it, when you get to the hills, because at 17 miles you take a right-hand turn on the Commonwealth, and you've got a series of four hills, and the last one being the, the longest, the steepest, and most famous, the infamous Heartbreak Hill. And he goes, I want you to run up those hills as hard as you can. And on the backside of them where they go down a little bit, I want you to run even harder. So as a, a soldier listening to his commander, which will – I, I would do exactly what he said. I hit that first hill, and I was I was in the lead. But when I say in the lead, Salazar was right off my shoulder, and and so I I busted up that first hill and the second hill and the third hill, and, and he wasn't. I mean, he was right there, and and I starting up Heartbreak Hill. I literally ran it as hard as I could, and I remember getting to the top, and I glanced over my shoulder, and Salazar was right there, and. There's a long, gradual hill on the back side of it where you come down. And I felt like I was doing the 100-meter dash. I was doing everything I can to try to break away from him. And I got down to where it flattened out on the bottom. And I didn't even have to look behind me to see if I could see him. He was so close I could hear him breathing. And at that point, honest to goodness, I could no longer feel my legs. And the thought of running five more miles at the pace we were running or faster, it was literally making me sick to my stomach. But as as bad as I was hurting, I knew Alberto had to be hurting just as bad because the last thing Alberto liked to do in a race was to follow somebody and not be in the lead. So I knew I had to have him hurting, but he had me hurting. But I knew this. I knew no matter how bad I was hurting, I knew I could suck it up enough to go one more mile and you know the good lord gave us this incredible gift between our ears called the brain and i was able to have my brain convince my body that all it had to do was run one more mile and now all of a sudden and i was going to win and now all of a sudden it didn't seem so daunting no i didn't have five miles to go i had i had one so i get to the next mile marker still got that little bit of the lead okay dick just one more mile bam there's a 23 mile marker Okay, Dick, just one more mile, you're going to win. There's a 24th. And then I said it again, and then as long as I live, I will never, ever forget what I saw next. In front of me on that on that uh, road in Boston, painted in blue and gold paint, it said 25.2 miles, and right below that, it said one mile to go. And at that point, I got so weak-kneed and rubber-legged, I honestly did not know if I'd be able to take another step. At that point, for some reason, tears just started streaming down my cheeks. And at that point, for some reason, I flashed back to that day in May of 1975 when I walked off my high school stage, the first one in my family to get a high school diploma, and I walked out to where my mom and dad were sitting, and my dad, who had an eighth-grade education, was crying. And I handed my dad my diploma, and he handed me a, a, a small envelope, and he said to me, D, this is your graduation gift from your mom and I. So I took it from my dad, and I opened it up, and, and I pulled out this small piece of paper. And in my dad's eighth-grade handwriting, it said, D, this is good for round-trip airfare to the Boston Marathon. Maybe someday you'll want to run it. Love mom and dad wow here i am not only running it i am winning it and i knew my mom and dad were back home here in minnesota watching it on television i'm thinking man Dick, you got to get your mind off your mom and dad and, and get back into the race so i got my mind off my mom and dad back into the race and with about 900 meters to go i had the biggest lead i'd had all day about an arm length and a half and i knew Salazar didn't have a great finishing kick but I also knew that he had a lot better one than I had. <laughs> and so I thought, Dick, you have got to dig deeper than you've ever dug in your life before and, and 
and make a move like you've never made before. And and I pushed off with my right leg to try to open up that gap. And Tim, when I did, I got the biggest Shirley horse in my right hamstring. I'm sure it was from dehydration from so little to drink. And Salazar went flying by me like I was standing still. He had five meters, then 10, and then 20. And at one point, he had almost a 100-meter lead. And I, this is all happening so quickly. And I'm thinking, I am like a half mile from the finish line. And now I'm thinking, am I even going to be able to finish? And, and I, I thought, you just keep working on the cramp and, and keep, as long as you keep moving forward, there's always that chance. And I can't say I learned more about myself in the last two and a half minutes of that race that has enabled me to get through way, way more difficult things in my life than that 1982 Boston Marathon. And what I learned on those streets, you know, almost 36 years ago is that no matter how difficult the situation you're in, no matter how high that so-called mountain is to climb, is that you just never, ever give up. And again, as long as you're moving forward towards that so-called finish line, even if it's a little bitty baby step, there's always... There's always that hope, and, and it's about believing in yourself and, and about that commitment and dedication and having faith and it's about being in the right place at the right time. And as Salazar continued to get further down this road on me, I'm running along the right-hand side of the road the best I can, trying to work that cramp out, and the crowd moved back so, to let me come by, and when they moved out of my way, I happened to be in the right place at the right time, and my right foot came down into a big pothole, and I stumbled and put her fell down. But when I put her fell down, it jerked my right leg. And when it jerked my right leg, it jerked it so fiercely that it popped the knot right out. And now I got my stride back, and um, I was finally able to, you know, start closing the gap on Salazar. And, and then we, we came up off of Commonwealth onto Herford Street. And then back then, you go about two blocks to the top of Herford Street, and back then you took a left on what was called Ring Road, and, and I caught back up to Alberto um, coming to, at, on, on the top of Ring Road with about 150 meters to go, and, and so here it was, we, you know, it, it come down, we, so we'd already run 26 miles, and now it's coming down to a 150 meter sprint, and, and, uh, and Alberto, uh, he, he got me, he, he, you know, we both you know, broke the Boston course record that day, but um, he uh, he ran 208.51, and I ran two hours, eight minutes, and 52.6 seconds. They rounded it up to 208.53. And, and I tell you, Tim, when I finished, I remember looking at the clock and, and still it was reading 208-something, and at the time, only one other person had ever gone that fast, faster than that. That was Derek Clayton on a kind of, perhaps a short course back in 1969 and over in Europe somewhere. And I remember thinking, wait, I just ran a 208 and I finished second. Something is wrong with this. <laughs> but part of me, part of me, Tim, had never been more joyful and happy in my life. And the other half of me had never been so disappointed. So I was having both these feelings at the same time. And I remember getting back to my hotel room later that afternoon and soaking in the tub, and, and I'm thinking, what could I have done differently to where I would have won the race and Alberto would have finished right behind me? And, and in my mind, I went back to Hopkinton, and I literally retraced in my mind every step of every mile from Hopkinton to the Prudential finish line area in downtown Boston. And when I got done, I was smiling from ear to ear because – there was absolutely nothing I could have done differently. That day, we both gave it everything we had, not 90%, not 95%, not 110%, because that's impossible. But that day, we both gave it 100%. None of us, if, if that race would have been another 50 yards, I don't know if either one of us would have finished. Neither one of us ever ran that fast again. That race on that very hot day took that much out of us, but it, it's a race that... As long as I'm alive, I don't think I'll ever, ever forget. And, 
it's a, it's a great memory, even though I didn't win it. It's still a wonderful, wonderful memory. I tell you, I've watched uh, I've watched that race uh, many times. That is the only good thing I've ever heard about a pothole. So I do know, have one good thing to say about a pothole now. <laughs> Now, now, I was asked uh, to pose this question to you. I think I know the answer, but we'll see. Right at the end there, when you had caught back up to Alberto, and you're trying, you're trying to get around that motorcycle that has no idea that you're there, and he starts right. turning, you have to go wide around him. Do you think that cost the race? You know, I, I get that question a lot, Tim, and, and a lot of, I think the majority of people, that when they watch that video or were there that day, they're... I've had people say, you would have won the way you were charging on Sozar. You didn't have to go out wide around that, that police officer on the motorbike. And, and I'll be honest with you, and, and I, I sincerely mean this, and I, I said this from day one, is that, you know, did the motorcycle get in my way? Yeah, maybe a little bit, you know, but I got around him. And I got around him, and I caught, I caught back up to Sozar then. So I, in my, I don't think... It really caused any difference here, but I think what caused perhaps the difference is, you know, I'd worked so hard to catch back up with him after I got rid of that cramp, and I remember when I got her on the motorbike and I caught back up to Alberto, and I remember saying to myself, okay, Dick, just sit back for a split second, take a deep breath, and just start sprinting as fast, as hard as you can. And that was, in my mind, that was a mistake I made because I kicked back up to Salazar. I kind of back off just a hair to catch my breath before I big, do the big finishing kick. And as, as exactly at that time, it was like Alberto could read my mind. He started his kick, and by the time I started mine and reacted to his, I, you know, we, I just ran out of room at the end, and it is what it is. But I'll tell you, the... That whole that whole thing would happen at the end. It makes for it makes it makes for a great story, and it, it is a great story. Well, I tell you, uh, both under the course record, both under the American record, and what did you get for that uh, fabulous time? Well, so Alberto got a really beautiful gold plated, uh, beautiful clock, and then on the top of it was, uh, in, you know, like a little uh, uh, plate, or not a plate, but a little uh, inscribed thing that said, Alberto Salazar, first place Boston Marathon, 1982, two hours, eight minutes, and 51 seconds. And I got the exact clock. It was just a little bit smaller. <laughs> and, and with the same thing, you know, 1982 Boston Marathon, second place finisher, two, oh, two hours, eight minutes, and 53 seconds. Because I get that question all the time. So... So how much your how about your parents' money? You know, what they give you to come there? I go, I go cheaper. I said, if it wasn't for the New Balance Shoe Company who flew me in, put me up in a hotel, paid for my food, I said the only thing I got that didn't cost me anything for the Boston Athletic Association back then is I didn't have to pay for my race number. I got a free entry, but back then the, the entries were like eight bucks. <laughs> Boy, <laughs> times. So like, Times have really oh. changed. Uh, wh- oh, yeah. What what would second what would second place get you uh, nowadays? Do you have any idea? Yeah. So second place, if you're coming in there with and you have those, that kind of you know, cause I tell you what, Tim. Oh, many years, many years since then. That time that Alberto and I ran almost you know 36 years ago, that would that would have won many a Boston Marathon since then. You know, it's a it's a brutal course, and but now. For, if I had to come in there, um, you, you know, now with a running in the you know low to mid two hundred nines, and uh, have a, a major victory under my belt like the London Marathon, you I would probably get somewhere between one hundred and fifty to two hundred and fifty thousand dollar appearance money, appearance money just to show just up. To show. yeah, and then and then if you win it uh, or get second, I think second place is. Right around uh, 100 grand for second place on top of the appearance fee. Yeah, it's amazing. Times have uh, really changed. You know, when I had uh, yes. when I had Bill uh, Rogers uh, did an interview, he told me that uh, the trophy that he got uh, at Boston got stolen. Uh, I know that uh, Coach Squires was going to auction your shoes off, I think, for his church after that race. Yes. And- 
What happened to those shoes? So this is the craziest thing, Ken. So El, they, they take Alberto after he finished over to the medical tent to get a, about five bags of IV fluids. And I should have been right there with them, but, but they took me into the, the garage of the Prudential Insurance Building. There were about 300 press people in there. So I'm sitting up, kind of about they made this little platform, and I'm sitting up at this table talking to them. I, I was up there for about two and a half hours answering questions, and I had taken my New Balance racing shoes off and put them on the table, you know, because, you know, your, my feet were sore and everything, and, and so there were some media people behind me. So I turned around, and I answered some of their questions, and I turned back around, and my shoes, my racing shoes were gone. And uh, I thought, well, somebody from New Balance must have grabbed them. So finally, I, I got up to my room, and, and um, I'm soaking in the, the bathtub, and the phone rings, and, and my then-wife, Mary, answers the phone, and the guy on the other end goes, is this Dick Burz's room? And she goes, yes, it is. And he goes, well, tell him he ran a great race today, and I'm the one that took his shoes. Click. Haven't seen him since. Unbelievable. Yeah. Uh, I know, I, and I was going to give him to Coach Squire's church to auction off uh, to help a bunch of kids, you know, uh, in the in their youth program and stuff. But yep, somebody stole them right from underneath me. <laughs> and uh, I tell you what, uh, epic race. Uh, if for you listeners have ever never seen the end of the uh, eighty two Boston Marathon, you need to check it out. I loved the painter's hat that you wore, and I know that after that race. Uh, the kids were asking you for, you didn't have a whole lot of clothes to give away, but uh, they, they, they wanted your hat. You gave it away. Well, Tim, it was the craziest thing. So, you know, I, I'm, I've got security people around me, and, and, and inside the finish shoot, it was, it was chaos. You know, the, they knew the race was going to be this incredible finish, and then at the end, the, between the media and the spectators, and again, no fencing or anything, it was it was like the L.A. freeway at 4 o'clock on a Friday afternoon. You couldn't budge. And, and so I'm just basically standing there with security people trying to get me to the Prudential garage basement when I feel a tug on my shorts. And I look over to my right, and there's two young boys, probably about eight years old, seven, eight years old, standing there. And the one little boy says, Hey, Mr. Beardsley, can I have that new balance uh, painter's cap you're wearing? And I said, Sure. So I took it off, and I put it on his head, and, his little friend says, hey, Mr. Beardsley, can I have that orange sponge you got sticking out of your course? I trapped <laughs> the sponge out of the, the course, and I didn't want to carry it, and I, so I just put it in my shorts, and it was half sticking out. And I, I go, sure you can. And, you know, and I'm thinking, man, if these guys have many more buddies, I'm going to be buck naked here pretty soon. And, but what's so incredible about that story, Tim, is so I had completely forgot about the hat. Well, 22 years after that race, John Brandt wrote an article for Runner's World Marathon or Runner's World Magazine called Duel in the Sun. And it, it was such a hit that they made it into a, a book. And, but it was about that race Alberto and I had. Fantastic was, book, by the way. Yeah, John Brandt did an amazing job with that book. He really did. And, and so about a week after the uh, Runner's World Magazine hit the newsstand, I got an email from a gal, dear Dick. My son John, he's an avid runner and whatnot, and and uh, he was reading the article, the Duel in the Sun, and he was looking at the pictures, and he and he, he saw those pictures of you and Alberto, and he called me up and he said, Mom, do you think Dick would like his cap back? So twenty two years later. This young boy who was now obviously an adult sent me that cap back, and um, I was—I I remember taking it out of the, the package he sent it in, and I put it on my head. And back then, the painter's caps—they were paint, they were made of the paper, and and little you know little particles of paper went flying and stuff. And and um, my my wife Jill um, got it all, um, you know, she shadow boxed it and everything with my race number. And then now it's actually sitting out at the in the New Balance um, Museum out in um, in Boston, Massachusetts, at their uh, brand new world headquarters out there. They asked if they if if they could have it for the museum, and I and I talked to my boys, um, Andy, my older son, and and 
my two uh, other stepsons, my uh, two stepsons who are like my own boys, Matthew and Christopher, I said, guys, I said, are you okay if it goes, if, if they take it? And they go, they go, yes, but if we ever want it back, you know, want it, can we get it? And I said, absolutely. So that was the stipulation that they can, New Balance can have it as long as they, they want it, but if, if, if my boys want it someday, then they'll get it back. I'll so, tell you what, pretty- uh, you looked pretty good in that hat when that uh, picture of Alberto, uh, Bill Rogers, and you. And I do have to say one thing I got to really give you a compliment on. From the very start, uh, nobody gave you a chance, but New Balance did. And I read the story about uh, the Radisson and the New Balance uh, right. rep, rep giving you a chance. And uh, one thing that I bet the listeners don't know, even uh, uh, a lot of the runners out there, right before Boston, you your contract was up with New Balance. Is that correct? Yes, it, it expired on April 1st of 1982. But, you know, I'm one of these easygoing guys. I even, you know, I wasn't concerned that, it, you know, that I didn't have the contract. I knew they were going to, they just hadn't got around to it. I knew it was going to probably happen. And, and so I wasn't worried a bit about it. And uh, what happened right before the race? So the night before, now let me kind of fill in the story a little bit here. So when I was, back then when I was, was running a, a big race, like the Boston Marathon, the biggest race of my life. You know, I'm a very, you know, I love people outgoing, but I would get, I was so focused. I would would be like a turtle going inside a shell. I didn't want to talk to anybody. I didn't want to see anybody. I, I, I virtually didn't even talk to my wife. I just, I just was in another world at that point. And so my daughter, somebody knocks at my door about, five o'clock that late afternoon the day on sunday the 18th of, of april of 1982 and it was a guy i know i won't mention his name but it was a guy from the adidas shoe company he says, dick jack and greta now greta white's one of the probably the greatest women's uh, marathoner of all time and from norway i knew greta well and her husband jack because i'd run and, and raced in norway a few times and we did some things together and and this guy from adidas says gosh dick we they, can you come up to my room upstairs? Jack and Greta just want to wish you luck tomorrow. I said, nah, I really, I really don't want to. And, well, finally I relented. And so I went up there, and basically they got me in a corner and started you know, brainwashing me about all the good things about that company. So I went back, and about a half hour later, there's another knock on the door, and it was the same person. And uh, I'm thinking, oh, man. And he goes, he goes to me, he said, Dick, here's the deal. He said, tomorrow... If you wear our shoes, our shorts, a singlet, he says, I'll give you $25,000 cash right now. Now, that was a lot of money back then. That's still a lot of money in my book. Yeah. And, and he says, and I promise you, we'll sign you to a long-term contract no matter how you end up doing tomorrow. And I remember looking at him, and I'm thinking to myself, could you, and I'm thinking, could you imagine here at New Balance in 1979 took a chance on an average at best runner that had no money to buy a new pair of shoes, gave me a free pair of shoes that day, sent me a whole bunch more after that, signed me to a small little contract eventually. But could you imagine, they were the, and I went to every shoe company at this sporting goods convention, and nobody would even give me the time of day except New Balance. Could you imagine if I would have showed up the next day wearing that Adidas clothing and shoes and stuff. My name, I don't care if I would have set a world record by five minutes, my name would have been mud. And I just, I basically slammed the door in his face. And, um, you know, I, I've got integrity also. And I thought, there's no way I would ever even think about doing that, let alone actually do. And, you know, I'll tell you what, when I snuck into that convention hall in 1979 and got kicked out three times and finally got in there and and I got those a free pair of shoes from New Balance, and then it, 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 it's it's been well. It's I've been with them uh, now for 38 years, and you know, obviously, it's not for my running talents anymore. That that finished 30 years ago. But now I'm more like an ambassador. You know, I go out. They send me out to running specialty stores around the country, and I'll give a talk or two, and go for a little fun run with people. And and uh, now it's just you know, basically an ambassador. But you did you didn't. You didn't sell out. Nope, I didn't sell out. And 
and um, and I know athletes. Um, well, I know when I competed in other parts of the world, and like especially Japan, Asics or it was Tiger at the time. They'd come into your hotel room and they'd say, "Hey, listen, where are our stuff tomorrow? Nobody's going to know." Of course, there wasn't social media and all this instant news and stuff like there is now. We'll give you five grand. You wear our stuff, and I, I and I I know a number of guys that did that did that. And you know, in fact, I ran the Beppu Marathon, which is a big marathon in Japan in 1981. And I know a couple of Americans that were running for Nike that wore their shoes and got five grand and. And uh, two of the three guys that that did that ended up dropping out because it got blisters so bad and stuff. So you know, karma is an interesting thing. It'll come back to bite you. <laughs> oh, I tell you what, uh, I, I love that story about you sticking with New Balance. And I tell you what, uh, I, we got to cover some other things. So do you mind if we move on to something else? Absolutely, you uh, betcha. Okay, let's let's move on to some of the tough times. Now I know that you were in. Uh, I don't even know just like how many marathons you run, how many uh, surgeries and different things you went through due to different uh, traffic accidents, uh, getting hit while you've been running. But I really want to talk about, I think, what I think was the most brutal thing that happened to you was that uh, farming day and uh, the power takeoff on the tractor. You want to run us through that? Yeah, it, yeah, no doubt, Tim. Gosh, that's, um, that was, wow, 29... It'll be 29 years ago, coming up in November, and that's one of those things I, I still remember most of it very vividly. I, I got up, you know, I, I had a dairy farm back in Minnesota, and and I had, you know, I look back now, and I probably had too many irons in the fire. You know, I was, I was milking 70 cows. I was, I, I still, I was doing my fishing guide business that I started when I was 12 years old, and and uh, you know, was involved in the community and stuff. And I, anyhow, I got up that morning at you know, quarter to four, like I always did, and went out and milked my 70 cows, and I got done with a few other chores, and I was walking back to the house to give my, my wife and my son Andy a good morning hug and an I love you, and I remember walking between the barn and the house and started thinking about all the things I had to get done that day, and I thought, you know, I'll just give him a hug tonight and a I love you when I see him at supper time, and, you know, I turned around and walked away from the house, which was a huge, huge mistake. And I went down, I jumped up on one of my tractors, and uh, I started it up and I had the throttle just a snorting, and, and I walked back to turn on the power takeoff to run an elevator. To I was going to unload a few wagon loads of corn up into a corn crib. And, and I remember pulling that lever, and I kind of turned a little bit, and it was like I thought somebody had come up from behind me and grab me by my shoulder blades, blades and body slam me backwards into the ground. Well, the next thing I realized, my left leg was being wrapped up around that spinning power takeoff shaft that spins at about 600 revolutions a minute, you know, like a piece of string wrapping around your finger. And it, it basically just wrapped it all the way up to my groin, and then it started taking my whole body and just whipping me around. And, you know, each time it would slam my head into the ground, and, and it was probably, luckily there wasn't like a, a, uh, a wagon tongue or anything hooked to the frame of the tractor, or otherwise I wouldn't be talking to you. I'd, I'd have been dead a long time ago. But but it, it, it would bend me. I'm almost six foot tall, just about six feet, and it would bend me in half. And, and when it would when it would bend me, I could I could hear the tractor kind of groaning, like I'm thinking, please God, let it just stall out. And then all of a sudden, it would and man, whip me back around again and. And I, 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 every time I put my arm out, I was trying to reach the lever, and and I couldn't, you know, I, I, I couldn't grab it. It wasn't close enough, and 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 all these things were going through my mind, and and um, and I'm thinking, why didn't I go into the house this morning and tell my family I loved them and give them a hug, and and I don't know if I'm going to ever see them again. And I could feel myself starting to lose consciousness, and and I knew if if that happened, it would, you know, it'd be all over, and then. It was a very cold, gray November morning, and all of a sudden, it got so bright out. It was like looking up at the sun, taking at times 100, and it was so bright. And, and what felt like I was spinning around like a fast-spinning top, now it felt like I was in super slow motion. And all that noise, it was as quiet as the inside of a library. 
and I don't know if I was having a near-death experience. That's all I can tell you what it was. And, and I, I remember the part I still remember is I, I, I remember coming around in slow motion, or that's what it felt like, and I remember throwing out my left arm in my hand trying to reach that lever, and it was like the good Lord made my arm grow just enough, and I could, I could get my fingers on that lever, but I couldn't grip it. And I could feel my fingers slipping off, and I heard three words. And in my faith and belief, they were from God, flick your wrist, or flick your hand. I can't remember now. It was flick your hand or flick your wrist. And the next, and, and then that's, I don't remember anything after that until I was standing next to my tractor. To this day, Tim, I have no idea how I got myself unwrapped out of that tangled mess of machinery, but I remember standing next to my tractor, and I'm about buck naked. And I turn all my clothes on, and, you know, obviously I'm in shock because I'm thinking, well, gosh dang it, Dick, you better get some clothes on because the neighbor is going to come over and help me finish combining before the neighbor gets here. So I had no idea I was even hurt until I tried to take a step to walk towards the house, and I just face-planted into the frozen ground, and I knew that something was terribly wrong because my left foot was sticking in my left ear and I am not that flexible. And I came to find out later I had all kinds of head contusions and, and a concussion and all that. And I'd broken all the ribs on my right side and punctured my right lung. My right arm was broken. I had a piece of steel that there must've been a piece of old steel laying on the ground. Cause that was, they found that uh, stuck in my chest. And then my left leg was pretty near torn off. And, and, uh, but I remember laying there on the ground and, and knew I needed to get help. And I knew that my little boy Andy was off to kindergarten. And, and I knew Mary, I didn't know where she was, either in the house or in the barn, my first wife Mary. And so I, I, my left arm, I could function. And my right leg seemed okay. And so I started just slithering like a snake. And, um, trying to, you know, get to the house to get help, and I got about 100 feet away from the farm equipment when Mary found me laying in the driveway, and I could tell by the look on her face, you know, something was terribly wrong. She goes, oh my God, what happened? I go, Mary, I got caught in the power takeoff. you got to call 911. So she runs into the house, and she grabs our little portable phone, and she's dialing 911, and she's running outside, and they're asking her all kinds of questions, and one of them was, Mary, we need to know, is Dick still wrapped up in the power takeoff? Now, remember, I I crawled 100 feet away from the, any uh, machinery at all, and Mary comes running up to me and, and starts screaming at me. She goes, Dick, Dick, they need to know, are you still wrapped up in the power takeoff? <laughs> <laughs> and I started laughing. I, I, knew, I knew, Tim, at that point I wasn't going to die. I said, Mary, does it look like I'm still caught in the power takeoff? And she backs off a little bit. She goes, sir, I'm looking at him right now, and he's all wrapped up in that thing. And I'm thinking, holy cow, Mary needs the ambulance more than Uh, (laughs) I tell you what, that cost you five months in the hospital. Is that correct? Yeah, and and twice almost losing my leg. The first time when I got into surgery multiple times, but they were able to save it. And then I finally got home, and then I got a terrible infection. Infection. And I, I've never been so sick in my life. And I remember when the doctor, when, when the anesthesiologist put me to sleep and my, and my doctor told me, he says, Dick, if that infection is in the bone, we've got to take your leg above that infection. And at that point, I didn't even care. And I, I'll never forget this, Kim. I'm laying in the recovery room, waking up after that second, uh, third, the surgery to, after the infection. And the nurse is going, Richard, Richard, you know, open your eyes. Surgery's over. And I remember I, I wouldn't open my eyes because I was afraid I was going to see a stump. And um, and I finally I opened my eyes, and my leg was still there. And they, they were able to, thankfully, my physical therapist, who had come out to the farm, and I, I called her that morning when I got, I woke up that morning. I wasn't, I was, I thought I had the flu in my, you know, my temp by 11 o'clock that morning, it was my temperature was up to almost 105, and 
and my physical therapist was supposed to come out to the farm to work with me. And I called her up and I said, and I, I still remember her name. I said, Julie, you better not come out. I think I've got the flu. And she started asking me these questions. Well, jeepers, she was out there in no time. And, and I had this unbelievable infection in my leg. and it, it, it was nasty. So I was in the hospital for another three or four weeks in isolation. I mean, anybody, doctors, nurses come in, they were in full gowns and masks and stuff. And anyhow, they got rid of the infection. And, and um, you know, I eventually even got back to running a little bit again. Well, I know that uh, you had a, a real rough spell there, including, uh, uh, we're going to jump over it, but I'm just going to mention car accidents, getting hit while you were uh, running, and uh, multiple, multiple back surgeries, leg surgeries. You went through a really bad spell there. And uh, what that led to is uh, painkiller addiction. Yes, it was, you know, I tell you, Tim, I, you know, Growing up, I didn't drink. I, I'd never done any illicit drug, never smoked a joint in my life. And and um, I got addicted to these gosh dang painkillers. And, and you know, over the years, people have, you know, tried to make excuses for me. And, and you know, well, it wasn't your fault. It's those doctors. Well, baloney. You know, every doctor I got a prescription from, you know, told me the dangers of being on that medication for an extended period of time. You know, not, not one doctor forced me to take it. It was my choice. And then I would, I guess it would be called doctor shopping, and I think it's illegal. Well, it's pretty much impossible to do now because everything's computerized, but so they can see where you've been. And But, you know, I would go, I'd get a bunch of, of narcotic painkillers from this doctor, and then when he'd say, you know, I can't give you any more because it just can't, I'd go to another doctor, and then another doctor and another doctor. Well, finally I ran out of out of doctors, and then I started doing something I, I can't even imagine thinking of doing, let alone actually do. I mean, I had never been in any trouble ever in my life. I think I had, you know, one speeding ticket when I was a teenager, you know, for driving a little over the speed limit. I'd never stolen as much as a piece of bubble gum, and I started forging my own prescriptions. And I, I knew it was wrong. I knew I could lose everything I'd ever worked for in my life, but at that point, all that mattered was to get the drugs, to take the drugs, and make sure I didn't get caught. And, you know, telling um, this version I'm telling Tim is just doesn't even you know, barely scratch the surface. When I this, is the, the this is the shortened version due to time constraints. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah absolutely. I mean, the very shortened conversion because... When I'm, when I'm asked to speak at a drug treatment uh, facility somewhere around the U.S. or Canada, just that part of my life takes an hour. And um, by August of 1996, I was taking a cocktail of Valium, Percocet, and Demerol, upwards of 80-plus pills a day. Wow, I would think that would kill a person. Well, you know, now you got to remember, this. It, I didn't start off like that. Um, this was over about a four-year period where I got to that point by August of 90, 1996. And, um, but it got to the point where um, I, they were, I mean, before I finally got caught, I, it, they, they didn't even make me feel, you know, give me that so-called uh, high or whatever you want to call it. I mean, I was having to take pills every 20 to 30 minutes because I'd get such terrible headaches and I'd have to drink. Uh, a half a bottle of Maalox or Pepto-Bismol to coat my stomach because I was burning a hole in my gut. And and thankfully, on uh, September 30th of 1996, I think I was probably a day or two of taking a handful of pills one night and just never waking up, and I got caught. And I knew I was in a lot of trouble, but I was so blessed and so so thankful I was still alive, and I knew the only chance I had if there was any chance at all to get better, was to be 100% truthful, take responsibility for my actions. You know, that's what I did. I, I didn't have to go to prison. I was given, you know, five years of probation and 460 hours of community service. And I went, they took me right to the hospital and, and I got into a treatment program. And, and um, this, you know, just about a month ago, well, not, not even a month ago, three weeks ago, February 12th, I celebrated my 21st uh, anniversary of sobriety from the drugs and 
and it you know it it, it hasn't been easy always, but um, it's uh, it's been worth every effort. And and I after a few years of sobriety, I looked at it as um, well, you know this this was good. I mean, you know, I survived. I learned a valuable lesson. But the best part is, at least I know I'll never ever ever have to go through anything more difficult in my life I was uh, it's, you hit bottom I mean uh, that's that's it you hit bottom I hit bottom and I thought this is good I'll never have to go through anything more difficult in my life and unfortunately that wasn't the case now hold that thought for just a second uh, ladies and gentlemen you're listening to the Uncle Tim show on Vintage Radio 105.5 that's WQUD in downtown Erie uh, we're talking with uh, Dick Beersley from uh, Minnesota tonight world class runner and uh, world class human being been through a lot motivational speaker and uh, back to you Dick that uh, that bad stretch with the addiction uh, wasn't the bottom it wasn't. No, um, it wasn't. I thought it was going to be, and, and for many, 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 many years, it, that was it. And then um, my my oldest son, my 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 son Andy, who was he's a, was a great kid, and and uh, when he turned twenty twenty one, he joined the United States Army, and, and he he loved serving our country, and and um, he was a uh, he was a gunner on a Black Hawk helicopter. He got sent to Iraq, and and um, and when he wasn't doing that, he was in charge of a crew. When the when the choppers were coming from the field with the wounded and whatnot, they'd, they'd get the wounded off, they'd give the chopper a quick mechanical check over and, and refuel and get it back up in the air. So Andy saw some things and um, and had to do some things that weren't real pleasant, and, and he got back home to where I grew up, and he grew up in Detroit Lakes, Minnesota, a town not too far from Bemidji in northern Minnesota. And, and anyhow, he, he suffered from PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. And, and uh, you know, he and we, we thought, you know, we had it under control. He was working with a doctor at the VA hospital in Fargo, North Dakota. And But anyhow, um, two years ago, this past October, um, He took his life, and um, boy, I tell you, um, that was without doubt. Um, of all the things that I've been through in my life, I really I look back on them, and I, I wouldn't change any anything. The drug addiction, the accidents, the surgeries, because I learned and I grew from those. But if I could go back and change one thing, it would, that was, it would that, be that. That was definitely going to be one of my questions is... Uh, regrets and uh there there it is i can't yeah imagine. no regrets other than that and if if you know if if i could bring my son andy back and um oh my gosh i do it in a heartbeat and i uh i miss him dearly and you know i'm a lot better now than i was in that first few months of that first year and but i don't i don't know that there's an hour of the day when i'm awake that i don't think about him you know not that i dwell on andy and just something will remind me, and it's all good things. So it's 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 because he was the kind of kid we. Had, my first wife Mary and I adopted Andy as a baby from Honduras. We couldn't have uh, our own kids, our own biological kids, and and we adopted Andy when he was a little baby, and and which made it even more special. And he was just a he was a great kid, and and um, you know you could put him in a room with a bunch of grumpy old men, and. and Five minutes, he'd have him laughing and hollering, and and uh, he was just and everybody from the from Detroit Lakes, Minnesota. It's a small town, and they all knew Andy. The police all knew Andy in a good way. He he loved driving his. He had a 1998 Cadillac. He loved cars and trucks, and it was all it was uh, all you know decked out and stuff, and and uh, everybody everybody that knew Andy. To this day, still misses him dearly, and as I do, and and uh, he was a wonderful, wonderful young man, and he he left the earth um, too early, 31 years old, and but you know, you know, you hear people say, well, so and so, they're in a better place now, and but Andy really is in a better place, and and uh, he fought a lot of demons and stuff, but um, 
I miss them dearly, and, and but someday we'll uh, someday we'll we'll meet up again, and it'll all be good. Dick, Dick, I don't know how you do these uh, motivational tours. I've seen you speak. How can you stay so upbeat? You've been kicked so many times. Well, you know, people ask me, uh, especially with Andy. You know, gosh, Dick, how do you how do you handle this? And um, you know, did you ever think about you know taking some of those painkillers? And I'll be honest with you, yeah. Especially when it first happened, and but what's helped me, Tim, is is my mom gave me a guitar when I was 12 years old, and and uh, I can't play it a whole lot better now than I could when I was 12 years old, and I'll be 62 in about three weeks. <laughs> and um, but I I write my own songs, and I've I've written um, a few songs. One in particular that it it's something that happened shortly after Andy died, and it it, it gave me the song brought me joy and, and um, it brought me it, it brought me hope and um, um, I know we're I know we're short or not sure if I've been yapping to you for over an hour I tell you now if, if it doesn't work that's fine but I've got my guitar here and it, it's, it's a song that takes about three and a half minutes if you and your listeners would like to hear it I'd be, I'd be more than happy to play because it means a lot to me is what brings me joy and hope. Um, but if not, maybe if I get the chance to come down there and speak uh, in Erie sometime. I think, I, think I have a feeling we're going to get you in the studio here. That would be awesome. I have a feeling you're going to be coming down here to Erie. I'm going to make it happen somehow. I want to play. Tw- I would love to do that. Uh, I'm going to play twenty questions with you now, uh, rapid, yeah. fu- rapid fire. Uh, just because. Do you do radio? For some reason, I was thinking you did radio up in Minnesota. Well, if, when uh, I live in Bemidji now, but when I lived in Detroit Lakes, um, I, I did a fishing show, and uh, and then one of the one of the guys got fired that was on this early, early morning show. So they said, Beards, you know, do you want to do this early morning radio show? You can still do your fishing guide business and, and whatnot. And, and I said, well, yeah. And I didn't know, I didn't know how to push a button or any of that stuff, but I learned pretty quickly. And, and uh, so yeah, for a couple of years, I did an early morning um, radio show on a, a country music station in the little town of Detroit Lakes, Minnesota. It was a lot of fun, I'll be honest with uh, you. I'll tell you what, you're kind of reminding me of myself here a little bit. Uh, same thing uh, here with me at uh, Vinny's Radio, so it is a lot of fun. Okay, here we go. Gr- greatest, toughest runners. Who are your favorites? Who who uh, who mentored you? Who did you look, t- look towards? There's, it, it's not even close. Bill Rogers. Bill... Bill and all the guys I've raced over the years, and including Alberto Salazar, and Alberto now saying that Alberto and I didn't race a lot against each other, obviously that epic race at Boston, but Bill Rogers and I, so when I was an up-and-coming runner, Bill Rogers was always somebody I looked up to and was a mentor, and, and, uh, and Bill is, of all the runners I've met, Bill and I have stayed in very close contact with each other and we're very very good friends and we've done a lot of things together we brought him to our race back in detroit lakes a couple of times over the years and and uh, but bill i tell you as nice of a guy that bill is and you won't find a nicer human being in the world but i'll tell you when you lined up against him in a foot race i'll tell you what it was the elbows were sharpened and it was it was you won't find a more tenacious racer. And everybody talks, you know, nowadays about, you know, uh, Galen Rupp and at one point Ryan Hall, and they're all great runners. But in my book, there was nobody, and there has not been any American, in my opinion, that that had the kind of record and the tenaciousness of a runner as Bill Rogers. Hands down, nobody else, in my opinion. Uh, I tell you what, uh, Bill Rogers is quite a guy. He's been emailing me lots of funny things about you. I know he's been up there fishing. You, he said uh, you took him out. You ca- uh, caught him the the mother of all bass. I did see. I did. 
I did see you and Bill at the 1981 Houston. I ran uh, Houston, and uh, all the big guns were there. John Lodwick, Benji Durden, Herm Atkins, uh, Jeff right. Wells, Jeff Wells, all those. You uh, were in second place down there, I think, by about 38 seconds, if I'm correct on that one. I was, and Bill and I had broken away. And get this. So this is how good Bill is. So we're running along, and all of a sudden, <laughs> Bill turns to me and says, he goes, so Dick, he says, man, he says, I gotta, I gotta sneak off into the woods and, and, and take a number two. <laughs> and I go, he goes, he goes, just keep running. I, and I'm thinking, dang right, Bill, I'm not gonna wait for you. So he, he takes off across this field into the woods, does his thing, gets back on the course, catches up to me, and still beats me by 30. <laughs> Uh, I think he ran a 212 or something like that. That's pretty amazing. I did not know that. But uh, I'll tell you what, we aren't going to get to some of these things, but I know that your coach slept in a, uh, at the Falmouth Road Race, your coach, Bill Squires, slept in a bathtub so you could have a bed. Uh, can you confirm that one? Yeah, absolutely he did. The coach Squires, I just had met him in the, in a few weeks earlier, and he, he asked me if I needed a coach, and I didn't have one at the time. And so New Balance brings me in, and they – I'm going to run Falmouth, and so we're, we're at this house, and it was, I think I was the only runner there. We were staying the night before, and Coach Squires had a friend. He said, yeah, I think it'll be nice and quiet. Well, they were partying all night long, so I went up, and I, I laid, there was no beds available, so I just laid on the floor and grabbed a blanket, and Coach Squires comes up, and he goes, Dickie, what the hell are you sleeping on the floor for? You should take my bed. Coach, I can't do that. No, I, you take it right now. So I went and got into the bed he had. And, well, about 4 o'clock, I got up to go to the bathroom. And I walked in the bathroom, and I flip on the light, and I noticed something to my left. And I look over, there Coach Squires is sleeping in the bathtub with a little towel over him for a blanket. That's the kind of guy he was and still is to this day. And he's, he's you know, in his mid to upper 80s now. And, the guy would give you the shirt off of his back. Greatest American distance coach we've ever had, in my opinion. Well, speaking of giving the shirt off your back, I think you uh, fit right in that category as well. So uh, i tell you what, so much to talk about. I know we aren't even going to get to uh, dog attacks, uh, other accidents, di- uh, other, <laughs> other, other adversity. Uh, that you have overcome, and uh, that's, uh, I've watched some of your uh, speaking uh, on uh, YouTube, a uh, real inspirational guy. Tell me, is the movie uh, Against the Wind, is that going to happen? Well, I'm not sure, Tim. If it's, you know, just the fact that a movie producer from California contacted us, and, and I sat down with him and, and wants to make this movie, just that was an honor that anybody would even think that it could make a movie. And now, the, I just, in fact, I'm going to be having supper with him and his wife and a couple other friends tomorrow night when I get to the to Napa. And um, but there, he's just working on trying to get funding for it. And, and if it happens, great. You know, if it doesn't happen, that's fine too. But uh, we'll see what we'll see what comes of it. Well, it would be. Uh, it's quite a script. Uh, I think it's a uh, movie uh, worthy. That's for sure. I tell you what, uh, we're going to wrap things up here, but uh, I want to know if there's anything else you'd want to. I mean, I could keep this uh, interview going for three hours, but until your phone, <laughs> until your cell phone uh, battery gave out. But uh, what, what do you what do you say to uh, young uh, young adults, uh, r- future runners? What's your advice? What's your advice? You know, it's just. Never give up. You know, I, I look at myself who I didn't even make the cross-country team as a junior. You know, I was on the JV squad. and But I remember that summer between my junior and senior year, I thought, man, I'm going to run every day this summer, and I'm going to make that cross-country team. And, and I'm not a braggart type of a person, but I came back from my senior year, and, and I was probably one of the worst guys on the team the year before, and, and I came in there, and I was our number one runner. Now, that's not saying a whole lot, because we didn't have a very good team, but, you know, if you if you have a passion for it and believe in something, do not let anybody, including yourself, ever talk you out of that dream to go and pursue it, because you never want to get old to the point, and you look back and say, gosh darn it, why didn't I give it a shot when I had the opportunity when I was young 
and I could do it. You never want to look back on that. Uh, I think it all goes back to that statement that you made or that your coach made that you remembered. You can be as good as you want to be. Do the work. Absolutely. That's exactly. Real quick, real quickly, do you think doping's a problem in long-distance running? Unfortunately, I do. You know, it, it makes me sick because, you know, and there was rumors of things going on even back when I was running. But, you know, I I can sit here right now and, and put my hand on the Bible, and I can tell you, Tim, that, you know, I didn't even, I wasn't even taking an Advil or a Tylenol back then. And, and now, you know, anytime anybody runs fast or runs, you know, uh, fast marathons time after time, you know, everybody, oh, they must be dope, it must be dope. And there, there's no question that there's a problem out there. And, and I think part of it is with all the money that's out there now in, in distance running, you know, they're trying to, you know, uh, get this advantage and whatnot, and and to me, the solution is pretty simple. You don't give any of these two-year bands, four-year bands, and then they cut it down to two if you get four, or cut it down to one or six months if you get a two-year band. To me, you get caught one time. I don't care if it if you say, well, gosh, I ate some tainted meat, or I took a vitamin, I, I didn't know this was in it. Too bad. That's your responsibility, and you get a lifetime ban. That's it. You no longer can 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 uh, enter or be in any type of competitive distance running again. I think that would eliminate the problem. But but unfortunately, the organizing committees and all these things that are involved with that, they are afraid to give a, more than a slap on the wrist. And until they do that, I think you're going to continue to see it. Yeah, it really hurts the sport. And you know what it hurts? Uh, a guy can run a world record and nobody will believe him. That's right. That's exactly any, That's what I said, Tim. Any, anybody, man or woman, runs a fast time, oh, they must be doping. And it's unfortunate because, you know, the majority of the athletes, I think, are doing it clean. But uh, all it takes is a few bad apples and then it spoils the whole, uh, the whole bushel basket. Oh, yeah, really rough. Okay, real quickly before uh, we uh, end it up, you're up there in uh, Bemidji, Minnesota, and I believe that's about nine hours, maybe eight and a half from Erie. But I took a uh, – listeners can just uh, g- get on their Google and Google Dick Beardsley, and they can look at this fabulous B&B that you're running up there. And uh, you g- you take people fishing. You are uh, uh, a guide – and it uh, looks like a great place to uh, show up. I might have to show up there sometime. Oh, you really should, Tim. Listen, it, my wife, Jill, we have Lake Bemidji Bed and Breakfast, and, and that's kind of her baby. I mean, I kind of help her out the best I can, but she's a great gourmet breakfast cook, and we have, it's a beautiful home that's over 100 years old, but it's been wonderful. It's very peaceful, overlooks Lake Bemidji. And then, like I said earlier, I've been a fishing guide since I was 12 years old. You know, open water fishing, and now, of course, we're into the ice fishing season, and we have three feet of ice on the lakes up here, so it's not, it's going to be a while before the, the ice melts. But, uh, you, ha- yeah. you, you have three feet of ice right now? Three feet of ice right now, and, and about in the last week, we've had almost 30 inches of snow here. I can't even get to a couple of my fish houses, even with my four-wheel drive truck, because the, there's the, the snow so gosh darn deep right now, but... That's part of living in northern Minnesota, and, you know, it's been a cold winter. We, You know, there's been many mornings I've been out running, and the, the actual air temperature has been minus 30, minus 35. And, but, you know, when you grow up in this stuff, you get used to it. And, but I tell you what, the, the days are longer now. Today it got up to about uh, 32, and, it, you know, I saw kids at the Bemidji State College walking around the – in shorts and t-shirts today because it felt foamy outside yeah it really is uh you know perspective uh yeah you won't be seeing me up there for ice fishing but possibly you know <laughs> uh, po- possibly in august i'm a hot weather guy but uh one one uh one other thing i know you've had double knee replacements due to all your uh, surgeries and accidents and things you're still running 50 miles a week is that right yeah pretty close to that, but i tell you uh, unfortunately my my left knee, which is the leg that got all messed up in the farm accident years ago, um, that knee, I got a terrible infection in my foot last spring and almost lost a few toes, but uh, they were able to surgically go in there and get things fixed up. But they think that that, that infection got up into the knee, and um, anyhow, it loosened up that that left knee, the, the all the, imp, the three different 
parts of the implant. And so on March 29th, I'm going in for a revision, and, and hopefully they'll, they'll get that all fixed up. And uh, you come up here in August, Tim, and hopefully I'll be uh, back uh, slowly running, and we'll go for a little run and then go fish the day. Well, you've had those knees for a while. The reason I'm asking is because, uh, not because of running, but because of an accident, I've got a bad knee. If I remember looking at, if I ever have to face a knee replacement, you're saying that there is running after knees. Well, you know, every doctor will tell you don't run on them anymore. But, you know, I look at it like this. You know, when I had my first knee put in, I was 52 and then 53 for the the next one. And and whether I ran or not, they last about 15, maybe 20 years. I think I'm going to need a new knee someday down the road if I live that long, hopefully. And, and running brings me so much joy, even though I run very slow now and stuff. I thought, you know what, by the time I need a new knee, the 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 way the technology is now, and even my doctor said, if by the time you need a new knee, he said the knees will be such that you'll probably be able to do anything you want to on them. So I looked at it; it it was my choice. And my doctor, he wasn't like, oh yeah, go run, but he wasn't saying, well, don't. He, you know, he he knew knows what running means to me, and he says, hey, it's your choice. And he said, if something happens, I'm here to help and fix it. And uh, so I chose that route, and and. Um, I, uh, I've, I've, I haven't run a marathon, a full marathon, since I've had my knees replaced, but I've, I've run multiple half marathons and other, you know, shorter events and stuff. And, and uh, my right knee never bothers me at all. And my left one, I think, once I get this fixed, that should be back good as new, and um, I'll be back at it. Well, I tell you what, if I can get you to run barefoot uh, by the time I get up there, maybe I'll be able to uh, keep up to you. So um, oh, there's, You'll there's... be able to keep up with me, Tim, I promise you. <laughs> all right, there's still hope for me. Well, I tell you what. Your coach said you can be as good as you want to be, and I think you are. I think you did the work, and I'm I'm proud to be able to talk to you. I, I, I'm so appreciative of you taking the time out of your night before you're leaving for Napa to uh, spend this time on the radio with us, and I'm hoping to uh, hoping to get you to get to see you right here in Erie. Well, I would love to come down there, Tim, and thank you so much for letting me be on your your uh, your show tonight and sharing some stories with your listeners. I, I really appreciate it, and um, you did a great job at the interview, and uh, thank you so very much. Well, I tell you what, if you run into Joan Benoit out there in Napa, and I think she's going to be there, tell... Uh, I will. Uh, I will. Uh, tell, uh, I, need, I need a uh, number or email for her because I'd love to get her on the air, too. Hey, you know what? She doesn't do many of those, but I will see what I can do. She's a good friend of mine, and I'll see if I can... Uh, I'll put the bug in her ear, that's for sure. Uh, well, I'll tell you one thing. I'm right in the same court with you on Billy Rogers. If you got Billy Rogers on your side, hey, you're okay. Darn right. And, uh, and he uh, he lined me up with you, and I really owe him as well. Tell you what, good luck on your uh, trip. Um, everybody that wants to learn a little bit more about the uh, bed and breakfast or anything about Dick Beardsley's life, just uh, just Google up Dick Beardsley. On, it'll take you right to his site, and you can, uh, you can watch videos. You can see pictures. You can see the fish that he's caught up there. So uh, <laughs> anyway, Dick, once again, thanks again uh, for being with us tonight, and I will be in touch. Okay, Ken. Hey, thank you so much, and uh, we'll talk to you again soon. Thank you. All right. Uh, uh, safe travels. Bye-bye. Okay, bye. Well, I tell you what, folks, uh, long interview, and uh, I hope it didn't go over the top there. You get a couple of runners together, and that's what happens. But this guy has been through everything, and he's come out on top, and uh, uh, he'd do anything for you, shirt off shirt off the back. Uh, everything's going to be changed here on uh, my show. I think uh, we're going to pretty much uh, get back to some music, not much commercials, Tonight's just different, and uh, I'll throw a song on here while I uh, clean up some paperwork, and hope everybody's having a great Wednesday night. Thanks for staying tuned. <laughs> 